So, I have been playing a bit of World of Warcraft Classic lately. Blizzard's clock rewinding of their flagship title back to the days before dungeon finders, stat simplification and fun quests. And despite fearing that I'd miss those things, I've been enjoying my trip back to Azeroth. I say enjoying, but I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. Don't get me wrong, I do like it, but enjoyment isn't the right word. The things I like about it are revisiting all these old places, chatting with people like we did way back when, and retracing steps over a decade old. There's definitely things that I could say that I like about the actual game in Classic World of Warcraft. You know, there are aspects of a design that encourage cooperation the way other MMOs kind of don't anymore. The cold, uncaring nature of the world makes it feel more like a world, as opposed to a series of quests laid out in a row towards max level. But if I'm really honest, the reason I like it is nostalgia. And I think a lot of other people are going to feel the same way. Ah, <sighs> cause... Let's be honest, saying that nostalgia is the big bucks these days isn't exactly going to be a scorching hot take by any measure. We got reboots, we got remakes, we got revivals, we got returns. The entertainment landscape is essentially a zombie apocalypse of these undying properties returning to menace the living. And if there's one company that embraces that necrophiliac attitude better than most, it's Square Enix. Between 15 Final Fantasies, 11 Dragon Quests, and countless spin-offs that bear the name of both, this is a company that has never shied away from brazenly milking its biggest names and resurrecting any name that could even have an ounce of profit potential squeezed out of it. I mean, Final Fantasy is a series that's gone on so long that it's considered passe to even bring up the inherently oxymoronic nature of the title. There are exceptions, obviously, but generally speaking, if there's a cow to be milked, Square will be there. Which makes it all the more surprising that one of their most beloved and popular titles has never had a true sequel. Chrono Trigger is one of the most iconic and beloved games in the entire medium, and it's difficult to overstate the impact it had when it hit the scene in 1995. Apparently, I was two months old at the time, so I think the indelible cultural impact of Chrono Trigger's original release may have passed me by somewhat. The version I played was this DS reprint of the original, so I didn't actually get to experience it until I had already played games like Final Fantasy VII and Xenogears for the first time. By that point, the genuinely massive influence this game had was present in so many games I'd already played. Playing Chrono Trigger was like playing a JRPG Rosetta Stone. Which makes it all the more surprising that, in 25 years since Chrono Trigger came out, all the games that have been influenced by it and how massive this game is culturally, there's still no sign of a Chrono Trigger 2. Unless you know where to look. Let's talk about a little game called Radical Dreamers. I'm holding up nothing because uh, this game, uh, you, you can't really get it like physically, like, um, uh, Radical Dreamers was written and directed by Masato Kato, who in turn was the main writer on Chrono Trigger. According to the man himself, 
the game was conceived as a way to wrap up some of the remaining loose ends left over from Chrono Trigger, and was developed in the space of about three months, which considering the quality of the final game is hugely impressive. I can't even get a video released in that time, oh no. The game was released in 1996 for the Satellaview, which was a weird sort of digital distribution radio add-on for the Super Famicom that was only released in Japan and look just just google it I'm sure there's I'm sure there's 50 other videos on YouTube covering this exact subject only being available temporarily through this single add-on and never seeing any kind of re-releases or even official translations supposedly at the request of Masato Kato himself Radical Dreamers is a game with obscurity written into its very genes and it's almost self-aware of this fact opening as it does with a character finding a secret journal written by their grandfather, and being whisked up by his words into the distant past of adventures long ago. In this particular adventure, we play as Serge, a young thief breaking into Viper Manor alongside his two companions, the mysterious Magil and the boisterous Kid, to steal a mysterious artifact known only as the Frozen Flame. Together, they are the Radical Dreamers, because this game came out in the 90s. We had to get Radical in there somewhere. Rather than exploring the manor directly, you instead control Surge through decisions made at certain choice points, like where to go, what to say, and what to do in certain situations. The actual gameplay amounts to simply reading the text and making the correct decision based on the information presented. It's essentially a visual novel, but without any of the more obvious visual hallmarks we usually associate with that particular genre. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. After all, most visual novels just don't take great advantage of their visuals. You'll get drawn scenes every so often in them, but for the most part, you get a stock background, some characters are standing in front of, and that's kind of it. Radical Dreamers instead uses lavishly detailed backgrounds to not only immerse the player in the setting of Viper Manor, but in the specific tone and style that setting is trying to evoke. The visuals aren't just saying you're in a hallway, you're in a larder, you're in a jail cell. They're saying this is gothic, this is horror, this is Robert E. Jordan, this is reading the back pages of a D&D monster manual late at night. It uses its visuals to explore the character of Viper Manor rather than simply show you a background for characters when they're speaking. In fact, it's actually quite reticent to show you the cast. You'll see them on certain screens, but they aren't the kind of omnipresent image they are in so many other visual novels. Like the rest of the game's visuals, it gives you just enough to establish the tone and the style, and lets you fill in the gaps. Plus, it means you don't have to look at Serge's outfit for more than is entirely necessary. While you'll spend most of your time reading this prose and taking in these visuals, there is a little more to Radical Dreamers than just reading and occasionally selecting an option. See, occasionally, while skulking around the manor's dark corridors, the crew will come across a group of enemies that'll engage you in a simplistic combat system. It plays out a bit more like a puzzle than a traditional battle system. In fact, it's ultimately about reading and selecting the right option but you know you you're reading into contextual clues offered by the text to select the right option so you know there is there is something there uh, it's not what i'd call complex in depth or good but it does surprisingly offer a, a little microcosm of the rpg experience despite all of its many, many, many limitations. When you don't know what option does what for each enemy, it's easy to get caught up in a series of bad decisions that leaves you with low health, which gives the halls of Viper Manor a real lethality that effectively communicates how hostile and dangerous this place is. But, once you get into your fight a few times, experiment with the different options, you'll eventually be able to work out the optimal path to defeat the enemies without taking any damage. It's like an emulation of the arc of expertise and mastery common to so many games, reduced down to its most absolute base components. 
It mirrors Serge's own journey to become a more confident, capable character as his relationship with Kit grows. While over the course of a longer experience, such a simplistic system would likely prove unbearable, in a game as short as this, it works just fine. I'm not going to pretend the repetition doesn't manifest into boredom at times. That's almost certainly this game's main problem, in fact. From the way you'll need to read the same text over and over, fighting the same monsters, running down identical corridors to find where you need to go next. For such a short game, there's a lot of recycled text here, and it can make it feel a bit of a slog at times. Especially early on, where you don't have as much direction as to where you should go next. What makes this worse is that you're essentially navigating a maze through the medium of text descriptions. And me and my fellow Murakami reading kids know how easy it is to get lost in a particularly meaty text passage. It's a struggle to orient yourself in this literary labyrinth is what I mean. Thankfully, most uh, PC versions of this game usually come with a fast forward button that can really help cut down on the navigation repetition. And if you're really struggling finding your way around, this is the perfect time to draw out a map of the environment to really fulfil a sense of mastery over it, and immerse you in exactly what an adventure would be doing in this situation. Or you can just stop lying to yourself that this is something you'll actually do, and go on game facts like the rest of us plebs. Oh look, this one's made out of ASCII, that's cute. There is something that makes it easier for me to endure this repetition. And it's not an excuse, not really, but it is something that affects how I feel about this game, and I don't know if I feel comfortable going any further without mentioning it. This is a fighting fantasy game book. Finding Fantasy is basically a choose-your-own-adventure book with a simplistic combat system based around rolling dice. Like a super stripped-down D&D, you, a usually nameless adventurer, would make choices to go to different entries in the book, and there you would either get closer to success or walk straight into an instant death trap that would turn your bones to dust in seconds, usually the latter. I had loads of these things, and I loved them. Even if only as a placebo for the video game RPGs that I really wanted to play, but were a little too expensive for a little kid to buy with reckless abandon. Everything, from the way combat is presented and how it works, to how the environment's laid out and how the puzzles are designed to work, to the way your goal is presented right at the start and kept firmly in place for pretty much the entirety of the experience. Radical Dreamers honestly feels like a video game version of these books, and because of that, the act of playing it is like tapping into some primal childhood sense of goodwill for me. Even when it is being slightly irritating, it's being irritating in a way that reminds me of things that irritated me before. It's being irritating in a nostalgic way. Radical Dreamers, in terms of its structure and plotting and design, really reminds me of these things. And as a result, it makes me nostalgic for them. That connection I have to that game, that not a lot of people probably will. So, take that as my bias, I guess. But there is another reason I'm bringing all this up. But let's put that point away for now. We'll be back for it soon. I mentioned just there that your goal, to nick the frozen flame from the foreboding feline Lord Lynx, remains pretty unchanging throughout the game. This is a pretty smart move for the writing. Without having to spend too much time detailing too many plot twists, the game has a lot of breathing room to take a peek into what's behind the curtain of our three main characters and the world they live in. We never learn too much. The writing is very reticent with concrete information and prefers to dole out things in tiny pieces that he can put together to form an incomplete picture. We learn about Surge primarily through the way he describes things the things he focuses on, the things he values. And we learn about Kid primarily through her actions, her responses to certain situations, and her preferred methods of dealing with problems. Magil, we don't really learn anything about at all, but you know, he's got the tall, dark, aloof, mysterious thing going on. That's kind of his deal. The fact that we still end up getting a pretty clear picture of who these people are, mostly through this, is a testament to the strength of this game's writing, I feel. The setting is treated with a similar amount of restraint. Various historical events, characters and factions are referenced, from the mysterious Acacia Dragoons that once occupied the manor, 
their mystical sword the Einlandsche and the machinations of other nations. The most significant thing we learned about all this is that the reason Kid is so determined to screw over Lynx is because he killed her sister. But even then, we're told surprisingly little about this. We never leave Serge's perspective, never learn the things he doesn't learn, and importantly, the game doesn't shove its connections to Chrono Trigger in your face. It just drops the right words here and there, and lets you put together the greater picture in your mind. Hearing words like Masamune and Poor in passing affords them a weight brought by our own knowledge of what they are, something that traditional exposition wouldn't be able to do nearly as easily. This combined with the visuals, which paint the picture of the scene so well that the narration rarely has to, means that Radical Dreamers is walking away with one of the tightest scripts I've ever seen in a visual novel. The game settles into a nice rhythm of exploring the manor and being presented with little points of light, characters to interact with or puzzles to solve, through which you slowly learn more and more about the situation. Once you reach this lavish room though, the pacing shifts and things kick into high gear. There's this great scene where Serge reflects on his own limited experience, being unable to discern the feelings of his companions, and Kid being unable to explain why she feels the way she does about her adventure. New and strange feelings that remain oddly familiar are beginning to bubble within her. Then, Magil actually starts speaking directly, and drops the bombshell that the frozen flame isn't just some valuable rock, but something not of this earth coming from a huge meteorite that fell from the sky. It was used by an ancient people who wished to harness its mystical powers and destroyed themselves as a result. Walking down this corridor, listening to this previously silent character become genuinely emotional and talkative for the first time, it really feels like you're walking into a much larger story. And that's because you are. In the catacombs beneath Viper Manor, the connections to Chrono Trigger that creeped around the edges of the story surge forth and shatter the illusion that this is anything other than an actual sequel to that classic. Before you even realise it, you find yourself in the ruins of the magical kingdom of Zeal, and our central villain reveals that Kid has been carrying nothing less than the Chrono Trigger itself. I love this moment. I love how casually this reveal is tossed out, how the game is careful not to give undue focus to any references to Chrono Trigger mentioned before this point, keeping things low-key and subtle. Okay, the villain yelling the name of the previous game in the series in all caps isn't exactly, uh, well, yeah, it's pretty overt, but to the game's credit, it doesn't dwell on it. It's not something that concerns our protagonist, so Kid dismisses it quickly and focuses on her objective, the Frozen Flame. Even after fully revealing itself as a sequel to Chrono Trigger, the game plays coy and focuses on its own narrative. I really love this. There's few things I find duller than a sequel that simply wallows in the successes of the original, and Radical Dreamer's faith in the strength of its own narrative is really admirable. I love the attitude of being able to say, yeah, we're the sequel to what is popularly considered one of the best, if not the best, JRPGs of all time, but you know, let's not go into that just yet. That is some serious big dick energy. And it makes sense, right? Sir doesn't know what the hell a Chrono Trigger is, and he's the one telling this story. Why should he suddenly bow to the player's understanding of the world over his own? Even in this earth-shattering moment of revelation, the game remains steadfastly committed to Serge's perspective, and oh, mwah, I love it, I love it. And this isn't even my favourite moment like this. There's one example in particular that stands out a bit more to me. Let's rewind a little. Yes, I know we're sidestepping the Chrono Trigger connection just as soon as it gets revealed, but, you know, if the game can do it, why can't I? Anyway. In the intro, Serge describes his impression of his compatriots. He knows little about Magil, so he doesn't really dwell on him. But despite some reservations, he does kind of gush about Kid, and makes mention of her skill as a thief. Trouble is, that's not really the Kid we see in the rest of the game. Kid is many things, but a competent thief is not one of them. She's frequently bungling things, acts like a bit of an idiot, and gets the party into way more trouble than she gets them out of. And that's not a slight against her character. She, as her name would imply, is just a kid that's in way over her head, out for revenge. So 
why does Serge describe her the way that he does? Well, it's because he has a crush on her. It's as simple as that. We as the omniscient narrators are able to see Kid as the inexperienced person she is, but Serge's feelings for her override the reality, and the gulf between his perspective and ours tells us a hell of a lot about how Serge feels about Kid, even before the more overtly romantic scenes happen. Once this clicks, it's, it's really charming and illuminating for both of their characters. It's probably my favourite writing work in the whole game, and ranks high on my personal list of "oh, that's so cute bits in video games in general. I also really like the way the game systemizes Kid and Serge's relationship. Like so many other games, Kid has a modifier that determines how much she likes and trusts Serge, which can be increased or decreased by making certain decisions. The difference is, that meter isn't used for Sevran or Miranda calling you over for a quick booty call when their meter is full. Rather, the only time the relationship values come into play is when Serge, and therefore the player, is at Lynx's mercy here. Unless Kid likes Serge enough, she'll let him die and you'll get a game over. Rather than using the game systems to empower the player in a rather sophomoric way of giving them a kind of digital SO, the system is used to disempower them, to put them at the mercy of an NPC. It's a really fascinating reversal of that dynamic. Where were we? Oh yeah, the, uh, the exciting climax of the entire game. So, assuming Kid doesn't let Surge die, the group battles Lynx, until the Chrono Trigger, tired of being ignored and brushed aside, goes off on one, and heaps a load of exposition into our laps. Finally, finally revealing just how Radical Dreamers ties into Chrono Trigger, and it's... it's, uh... well, it's something. So, remember when you were in Zeal in the first game and there was this blue-haired girl who hung around there? Shala? Well, apparently, after she disappeared during that whole business with Chrono dying and uh, Lavos breaking out to destroy all civilization in its fiery rage, the frozen flame, which was apparently there all along and is suggested but not outright stated to be a kind of control mechanism or communication system that the people of Zeal used to control Lavos, cast her through time until she reincarnates as Kid in the present day. Magil, as you probably guessed, is Magus, following around Kid to look after his sister. Though to the game's credit, it never outright says that. To be honest, I've never really been someone who was so concerned about Shala and what happened to her that I needed a whole game to answer that question. So I can't really say whether or not this is a satisfying answer for those who do care. But I suspect not. Still, there's your answer. You got it. You also get the offhand remark that Luca, a beloved Chrono Trigger character, was Kid's sister that was killed off screen by Lynx. You get the, the cherry on top and then a twist of the knife. Luca's death is a cardinal sin for many Chrono Trigger fans, a crying by Masato Kato that cannot be forgiven. And I get it, I do. She was a really likeable character and it's sad that she's gone. But it's not just a casual fridging or whatever. This death, as offhand and off screen as it is, is the linchpin of what this game is trying to say. Her death matters. In going back to Chrono Trigger the way this game is doing now, we inevitably have to bring cold hard reality back with us. Ultimately, the narrative of Radical Dreamers cannot stand up to this revelation alone, and Surge is literally consumed by the Chrono Trigger. It's interesting to me that Radical Dreamers is so secretive with its connections to one of the most popular and beloved RPGs of all time, especially since no one in this day and age is going to come into this game without already knowing exactly what it is. 
I've tried to highlight why I think the game deserves credit on its own merits, but whatever virtues that may have attracted people to this game when it was new, it is now, first and foremost, and maybe only, that weird Chrono Trigger visual novel. But in a way, it feels like the game benefits from this and anticipates it. If you pick up Radical Dreamers to play it now, it's almost certainly because you have an emotional connection, a nostalgic feeling associated with Chrono Trigger. And this game plays upon that, preys upon it even, to deliver its message. Remember when I brought up those fighting fantasy game books earlier? That wasn't just my own self-indulgence. It's something that makes me feel nostalgic when I play this game which ties into the game's story, which I believe to be, first and foremost, a story about nostalgia, a story about looking back at your own past and the pain of being unable to change it, yet unable to stop thinking about what might have been. About maybe the kind of person you were when you first played Chrono Trigger and the kind of person you are now. Here, on this dream of a shore near another world, Serge sees an infinity of himself, all different lives, different possibilities, but he's drawn inexorably back to his own. And here, listening to Yasunori Mitsuda's gorgeous soundtrack, we finally understand what this game is. Chrono Trigger was about changing the future. You were presented with the problem of a future ruined by Lavos, and spent the rest of the game on an adventure to erase that darkness. You changed the past, messed with the future, and ultimately created a better world. The final song in its soundtrack is called To Far Away Times. It's this upbeat song that perfectly punctuates that game's ending, of the gang off on another light-hearted adventure. It promises a hopeful and optimistic future because why not? You just killed a god and stopped the apocalypse. There's a thousand years of good times ahead, right? You're a bunch of kids looking ahead at a bright future. Enjoy it! Radical Dreamers is different. This game is an old man looking back at his youth at maybe the most significant night in his life. A night where he didn't steal the jewel, he didn't get the girl, in fact he lost her. After all is said and done, Kid and Magil vanish into the night, never to be seen by Serge ever again. Kid got her memories back, but as Serge we're not privy to what that means. We don't see her come to terms with being Shala. We just feel his loss. And while it's clear this Surge grew up, got married, had kids, settled down, we are, after all, reading this in our grandfather's journal, it's equally clear that he never stopped holding a candle for Kid. If Chrono Trigger is a group of kids looking at a bright future, Radical Dreamers is one of those same kids looking back on the past and wondering what could have been. Even Shala, the reason why she disappears and reincarnates is because she wants to run away from her past, from the decisions she's made. But ultimately, the past catches up to her anyway, and crawls back inside her head. It's presented as good for a kid, and it probably is, but it's just another reminder that you can't change the past, no matter how hard you try. Luca's death is a particularly important part of driving this home. A few of Trigger's party had some kind of tragic backstory, but of all of them, Luca's was the only one you could use time travel to heal. You can literally change her past to give her a better future. And now she's dead. It's cruel, yes, but I think it's critical in driving home what this game is about. It is the thematic antithesis to its predecessor. In Radical Dreamers, you can't change the past to create a brighter future. The past is unmoving, cast in granite. All you can do is look back and regret and dream of what might have been. As a sequel to Chrono Trigger, and it is a sequel, it is one of the most mature and contemplative sequels the medium has. Masato Kato intended Radical Dreamers to be like a cherry on the top of Chrono Trigger Sunday, just a little thing to tie off the loose ends he left behind. And as essentially an extended epilogue to its predecessor, Radical Dreamers does do that, I guess, but it's an emotional and thematic gut punch that is the come down of the century after the high of Trigger's ending. Maybe that's why there hasn't been a Chrono Trigger 2. Maybe that's why there hasn't been a big budget remake or reboot. How could they, with this sequel so thoroughly dismantling the notion that nostalgia is anything more than a longing for things we can never truly have? 
When I played World of Warcraft for the first time, I think I was about 10 or 11. I had my entire life ahead of me, and all the expectations and dreams that perspective comes with. It's been a, a hot minute since then, and while I still have dreams and goals and aspirations, the infinite potential of the childhood perspective narrows every day. During the making of this video, I stopped playing WoW Classic. Not because it was bad or because it wasn't fun, but because playing it eventually just brought me into thinking about who I was back then and who I wanted to be. And it was painful. The pleasure of indulging in nostalgia is fleeting and quickly replaced by regret. There is value in that feeling. There is value in a game making you feel like shit. <laughs> And boy howdy, those radical dreamers make me feel like shit. And it wouldn't do that as well if it was just a standalone thing separate from Chrono Trigger. Connecting it to that game that so many people, myself included, have such a deep fondness for, that is what makes this work. The game needs that connection to the past. To work as an emotional hangover, it needs to have the party that came the night before. It needs to have the promise of a bright future before it can break that promise. No more future adventures, no endless what's next, just you. A single timeline, a single point, leading to where you are now. This is it. This is who you are. This is who you became. These are the things you could have done but didn't. The choices you could have made but didn't. The jewels you could have stolen but well, you get the picture. Chrono Trigger is about changing the past to make a better future. To create a future out of nothing. But in Radical Dreamers, the future is unknowable and the past is immutable. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, you can do to change it. A bright future full of possibility was promised to us and sometimes it turns to ash in our hands. In the end, Radical Dreamer's status as a secret sequel to Chrono Trigger is probably what will forever define it, but it's so much more than that. It's an intelligent and thoughtful rumination on the nature of nostalgia and it leverages the relationship with its bigger brother in order to drive its point home that much more. We may never get an actual Chrono Trigger 2. But we can always lie back, close our eyes, and think about what might have been. I don't think it's possible for me to listen to this song and not get emotional. Video's over now, so if you aren't interested in me just sort of rambling on where I've been and what this video is, then just feel free to click out or something. So this video started out life as a uh, smaller project to sort of get me back into the swing of video making after I took a extended leave of absence. Um, unfortunately it didn't turn out that way. Uh, because of a number of things, uh, mainly because I wrote a dissertation over the summer, which uh, took up basically all my free time, uh, and also I just wasn't happy with the way the script was turning out. Uh, I just couldn't quite get uh, the right structure in there or something. There was something weird going on. I still don't know if I've entirely got it down. Uh, this video is a bit rough around the edges, a bit rougher maybe than I'd like, but. Uh, I just had to get out at this point because it was it was becoming a bit of a a bit of a white wheel for me. I have now finished my masters, so hopefully I'll be able to make videos much more regularly from now on, since I won't have that particular sort of Damocles hanging over my head. I ended up trying a lot of new things in this video, like the the live action stuff, which uh, I'm still not entirely sure about. Uh, I had fun doing it, but uh, who knows if people will actually like it or not. So. If you do like it, or don't like it, or have any strong opinion on it, just let me know and I'll take that into consideration for future stuff. The Silent Hill 4 video will be next, uh, I'm hoping to have it out within the next 6 weeks or so, 
Uh, I know it's been a long time coming, but uh, I did have a master's course to deal with, which is uh, somewhat time consuming, as I'm sure you can imagine. But definitely, only a year late, we'll, we'll have that Silent Hill 4 video. It'll, it'll be great, I hope. For those of you who are following, I do want to apologise for just how long it's been since the last video. Especially since I did that teaser for the Silent Hill 4 video that ended up being massively, massively overambitious. It really does mean the world to me that there are people who subscribe and watch the videos and comment and like them and all that stuff. And I hate the idea of just sort of letting you down in a way. Uh, I hope that this is sort of the last time that really happens. So yeah, that's basically it. I hope you enjoyed the video, uh, apologise for the long wait, and uh, I hope to see you in the next one.